I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's uh, meeting of August 21st. Um, today we have one agenda item, uh, and that is reviewing Copley Hospital's uh, budget submission. And so I'll ask Mr. McCracken to swear the witnesses, and then um, Mr. Wooden, we can proceed uh, with your opening statement on behalf of Copley. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Chair Foster, and um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Copley team. Since um, <clears throat> we just went through names, I won't uh, ask you to reintroduce yourselves um, unless you'd like to. Um, we're happy. I'm happy to go ahead and uh, swear you all in now. <clears throat> um, if you would raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. All right. Well, thanks very much. And I will turn the floor over to you. Hey, Sarah, if you could just tell us if uh, on you can see our screen share when it comes up. Yeah, thank you. There you go. You've Perfect. got the presentation. Yep. Oh, and I great. see the fancy laser too. Yeah, you're good. Well, it'll come in handy perhaps. Thanks everybody. Really appreciate it. it. Takes a lot of work and effort to get to this point. I really appreciate the folks around the table. Jeff is our chief financial officer. Uh, Nancy Banks, our board chair. Really appreciate her volunteer efforts in helping manage this facility as well as all of our volunteers. Kathy DeMars is an ex-board chair, but she's also the CEO of the Home Health and Hospice Agency. And so she's been very helpful and has been through these meetings before. So she might be able to add color. I appreciate that. Dr. Dupuy next to me is the Chief Medical Officer and General Surgeon. Very flexible in his duties to help us all stay focused. And uh, Karen Cavender is in charge of perioperative and emergency services. Karen this past year has been very flexible and I appreciate her taking on new roles and responsibilities as we all try to keep trains moving on time and forward. And Liz Kuto uh, also has taken on some new responsibility. I appreciate that Liz. She's in charge of our emergency department and all of those related services. So I think they're gonna be very helpful in this discussion. So I wanna go over a few things. I just went over our participants. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to quickly do an overview, strategic plan, finances, and then quality and access. <clears throat> the overview is just to get to know us a little bit, although you've been through a lot of these. So uh, our mission is we're, we're trying to tighten it up, but basically exceptional quality care close to home that does relate to our strategic plan. A lot of happy, appreciative faces of those that work here, I being one of them. We'll move on with that. Uh, this is uh, Copley, our history, been around actually 90 years and uh, going back some of the old photos and uh, the community involvement with the hospital is really touching. It continues, we have great relationships with everybody. Last year we celebrated 90 years. Uh, we did find, because only in Vermont, <clears throat> looking through the oldest of records, we found the name of the first baby 90 years ago. I asked somebody to go on Facebook, because you can answer most things out of Facebook or social media. They found the gentleman in the Northeast Kingdom and he attended our ceremony. So that was pretty fun. He was exactly 90, brought his family, and uh, that was kind of fun. Side story. This is our old hospital. I love this. Uh, I actually have a collection of antique Vermont hospital postcards. That's the usual collection to have. This is for Copley. Um, and it's now owned by the Loyal County Mental Health Services. So it's right near us really close to the hospital, just sort of down the street, but they, the designated agency manages and runs that. <clears throat> Love the list to the right. That was in the old days, they would do drives. Some hospitals would do a linen drive. Some hospitals would do food drives. This was a food drive. we got the exact materials and I'm not going to read it, but some of them are funny, like, you know, a can of rabbit meat or cans of unknown substance. So, uh, the overview of the hospital, we're an independent nonprofit CAH, one of eight in the state, which is a lot. Service area population, I give this to new employees. Every time we have new employees, once a month we do employee orientation. Service area is interesting because I've been around long enough. I think I've presented budgets since the year 2000. 
hospital service area definition. It becomes a concern because every time you see a numerator and denominator when you're doing the math, <clears throat> sometimes we draw conclusions about the calculation of hospital service area. My estimate for Copley is it's between 30 and 50,000 patients. The old fashioned definition used to be where is the majority of the inpatient admissions for a hospital to consider their service area? It has to be at least 51%. Anybody not making that, the entire area was considered contested. But when we do some of these math exercises, I think we lose track of something. So for us, maybe 30,000 is for our birthing center and the births we take care of, for example. And maybe also our ER, but I'm not sure about that. That might be fuzzy because some people do like to make an effort to come here. Probably 50,000 is more applicable to maybe orthopedics. So it's hard to look at just a hospital service area. Uh, we're a CAH emergency department visits. They've gone up quite a bit. <clears throat> I think Liz can attest to that. We budgeted at around 12,000. Paychecks, medical staff members, the volunteers and donors on the bottom are really um, quite important to us and uh, bring a lot of meaning to the meaning for the work that we do. Overview of services, a lot of hospitals give you this. So we have a variety of services from urology, neurology, you know, a lot of it's orthopedics, general surgery, gynecology, cardiology. Just figured I'd give you that list. I think every hospital probably has a list similar to that. Here's a discussion about our hospital type. So this is an agenda where I sort of say, what's hospital type mean? Well, there's three types of hospitals in the state. For the most part, critical access hospitals, which receive 99% uh, of allowed charges. Sometimes people get that wrong and think that it's more than that. Um, allowed costs. Um, and then uh, critical access hospitals, that's that category. PPS is sort of going back to 83 with DRGs. And then uh, tertiary care centers or academic medical centers get some additional uh, uh, benefits in reimbursement. Also expenses too. Uh, this is our size relative to the other hospitals. So we are just 3% of the budget. Um, so for the entire budget of give or take $2.8 billion, that was 2001. Uh, so that's just kind of helpful. I know a lot of the budgeting stuff, we go through the same amount of questions, which just makes it a lot difficult for a small critical access hospital to address as opposed to a much larger organization. Just sharing that perspective. Uh, strategic plan, we've done that. It's a three-year plan. We're a little over the halfway point in that plan in 2023. Three major themes coming out of that, which are most important, are financial sustainability, exceptional quality, and workforce culture, and keeping care local. <clears throat> Somebody had asked me when we went through the process, and a lot of involvement with the staff or some community members on committees, why isn't quality first? You know, why isn't your quality first? And it's like, well, I, I wish it was. We're hopeful to get to that point. It is certainly most important. However, we've got some financial issues and pressures that are really taking center stage. I think our quality is excellent, and Dr. McQueen is going to go over some of that, but finances sort of need to be there because we're sort of struggling for a lot of different areas. Um, going into the finances, um, Operating margin discussion. So this is our history over the past since I like, guess seven years. We've had a negative operating margin, really working hard to try to turn things around. We did get significant relief in 2021. I want to show you that without the COVID funding, we would add another negative 1.2% operating margin. So we're very thankful for that. It did make it look, look like we've got a great operating margin in 2021. <clears throat> I'm not sure how the staff and the finance team sort of gleans that out. But you get a whole bunch of money one year. Doesn't mean that you're super happy and all things are well. For me, I sort of did an average of those three years. It sort of said if we averaged out everything that happened for 2021 and 22, we probably had a positive operating margin of about a little over $1 million. So just wanted to share that with you. Operating margin. Now there's four themes here. Operating margin, 
our rates, prices, charges, kind of the same thing, days cash on hand and capital needs. So the first discussion outside of operating margin, it's just sort of our prices and charges. Um, this was a request we had a couple of years ago. We, we updated it in 22. The issue was that, you know, how our prices compared to Quest for-profit uh, lab out of Camden, New Jersey, unfortunately. <clears throat> Uh, just because it's out of state, that's why I said, unfortunately, it's helpful to keep business local and in state. So we did this. Um, somebody gave us a list of the most common CPT descriptors, and in all cases, 10 out of 10 charges, we were less than the Vermont average. And on many of those, we were actually the lowest by far. I did have asterisks on those, but on, on many of those, if you can see, we are by far the lowest. The hospital comparison with the hospitals around us where somebody might consider driving. <clears throat> so that's one study that we did. Uh, here's another study. This is with 2021 data where emergency department diagnostic imaging and old fashioned inpatient and board charges. In all of these cases, um, we were below the average in every single one of those. And on the starred ones, we were the lowest in the state. But these are these are pretty dramatic uh, differences if you sort of look at some of those. I know it's a lot to look at. Here's an update that uh, our CFO did. Jeff did this because the state had asked, so what if you get the charge increase? What would you look like compared to the other hospitals? Well, Jeff actually took every hospital listed up top A through M and took their prices and gave them the increase that is being requested. So if, you, if everybody got what they wanted for 2024, including us, what would we look like? And again, on the uh, starred items with the lowest in the state, we are lower 100% every single one of these on state average. <clears throat> and on the red ones, um, we're a little bit higher. Some of those is a uh, there, we're a little bit we're higher than them. Sometimes it's ten dollars. Sometimes it might be a little bit more. But this issue of us addressing prices, I'm going to sort of unfold this with more discussion. That our prices are are so low. Our prices, charges, same sort of thing. Our rates, not the rate of increase, but just sort of what is your charges has been a problem, um, and it's been around for well over 10, 15 years. So if you look at some of these examples, I'll just grab a few. Where we're extremely low. Here's just four of them. So this is a lab. Culture where $44, the highest in the state is 440. A urine bacteria culture, we're 27 compared to 222. 700%, uh, the next one is $1,500 versus close to 6,000. So that is almost 300%. Sort of in These are big numbers now. We're not talking, you know, a $10 Band-Aid versus a $2 Band-Aid. These are really expensive. And uh, an assay thyroid is uh, 195%. I'm only bringing this up because I think that of all the things we do, and there's so much data that we look at, so many ways that we look at data, cut data, new methodologies of looking at it over time or in a pie chart format. At the end of the day, this is what the patient sees on their bill. This is why they might have an HSA and go to a different hospital. We are, in, in my mind, just all over the map. It's not like we're give or take 10% or 20% swing. We, we're talking give or take 1,000% and some of this stuff. It, it, to me, it's hard to understand, but it's one of our problems because our rates are so low and I'm not sure how I'm going to play catch up to even get to average, but we'll be having that discussion given the rate request. Maybe you have some ideas because I don't know how to get there. Mm -hmm. We've been around way too long. I think I started this chart in the year 2000, so I don't have the first three years, but this shows every year. Oh, I can use my thank you very much. Every year, what was submitted versus what was approved. And anytime you see a red circle, that means somebody was clipped, for lack of a better word, the budget got clipped. And the red dot means that's the highest increase in the state. There's the lowest. And uh, this is Copley. And if you look over time, 
We went for 12 years, the only hospital in the state for 12 years, never being clipped or concerns about their budget. I might be proud of that, but I think we weren't asking for price increases. I think that was historically not a good idea because we were asking for zero or close to zero. And then if you look at the period after that, um, we got the most sort of adjustments of any hospital where we had um, eight years where we were downgraded sort of six times. And a few of these black ones are where we're in the negative and we continued in the negative. So I want to share that with you. This is when uh, the Green Mountain Care Board taking over from the Public Oversight Committee took place right here in 2012, just for perspective. Kind of interesting what happened in 2012. Uh, Mr. Wooden, can you can you stay on that slide just for a second? Um, sure. And have you provided these? I assume you have. Is that right? Yes, I think I've given a paper copy to some folks. But yeah, yeah, this is a great chart, and uh, I'd love to. I'll be happy to give you the Excel spreadsheet if you want to look at that. Uh, some years we've had dramatic adjustments. Uh, these two years when the Green Mountain Care Board started, amazingly, just stopped doing it, which is kind of interesting. And then we picked it up. I'm not sure what happened in 2015. Maybe somebody has an hypothesis of what happened there. So it's just it's just interesting. But we've we've not fared well in this process. But that's just me sharing with you. And I think in the past we didn't ask for enough money. I think there are many years we did not ask for enough of a rate increase. And that's why our prices are systemically just stuck. All right, thank you. Sure. Um, this is that same data just sort of summarized in three formats. You look for the past 15 years, we were the lowest approved budget increase in 15 years versus the highest, which was about 2.25% more every year for 15 years. I could have gotten 2.25% compounded over 15 years would be a different place. Past 10 years, we were also the lowest, um, off by 2.5%. And I'm thankful. So this is my fourth year presentation of budgets. This goes back five years. So I have presented and gotten three years approved. And I'm happy to say I'm not the lowest, and I'm really working hard to figure that out. But we've always been extraordinarily low. Do you have any questions? Anybody just sort of jump in. Uh, past um, CAH five year operating margins is right here. Back a couple of other years. So I think if you look at the history of this data, Springfield, as we know, which went bankrupt lost the most money. We're the second biggest concerning hospital in regards to losses on average. So that's again why I'm concerned about what we're doing moving forward. And here's that perspective about how much we got cut. <clears throat> so these are the rate requests going back to 16 and then this is what got approved. I accepted the 20 budget, but I have been um, here since I, I created the 2020 budget. I got here in 19. So we asked for negative three, we got negative four. We asked for zero, we got negative three. This is before me. We asked for zero again, we got negative 3.4. <clears throat> so we've had a lot of history and uh, happy to say I'm trying to correct things, but this history goes way back. It does show that for operating margin, um, you know, we're at 619,000. Just one step better than Springfield, which is a concern of course for all of us. And when you look at the outcome of the comparison, we continue to be, this is one of, there's many ways to look at what we do. And I think the all payer cost of care model is helpful. You know, how much do we cost relative to other counties? And it's another piece. I'm not saying I hang my hat on any of this stuff. You have to look at a bunch of them, but we're the lowest in 22. That's the latest data. And going back to 2013, which I think it first came out. Oh, sorry about that. We are the lowest. So there's something about this county and community and all the work that we do, whether it's home health, primary care, 
we're extremely cost effective. Uh, last couple of points I want to mention days cash on hand. We've had problems with that. We are at 83. Springfield is above us. We're down there with Springfield, Grace, and Copley. It's a concern. Cash becomes a concern um, for a variety of reasons, as you can imagine. Here's a chart on debt load capacity. Our long term debt to capitalization, we're, we're here about third from the bottom. We're actually much lower, but we did pick up a medical office building. Mansfield Orthopedics and that bumped it up a bit, but it becomes a problem. We have issues um, significantly when it comes to operating margin, cash, debt. And one of the problems with our debt and challenges, it's, it's hard to actually take on debt. We did get some debt from the USDA, but it's hard to get debt when you've got a cash problem and you've got an operating margin problem. So the USDA is very gracious and helpful to us, listen to our detailed story, and we got through that screening process. But they were very generous because our operating margin and cash alone would dictate that we are extremely high risk. Not that I'm happy to report that. <clears throat> Here's a chart that I had to come up with to figure out why our capital is so underfunded and why some of the uh, why some of the Items around here are in dire need of repair. If I look at IT alone, our IT infrastructure and closets are in horrible shape. Our operating plan, boiler room, we've got a number of issues. So this is a chart that I did to sort of say, okay, each year, what did we budget going through our staff analysis process, a lot of detailed discussion with every manager, the need, age of equipment, all sorts of things. That going through our finance committee, then our board, then going to the Green Mountain Care Board and getting approved. So this is our budget and this is what we spent. <clears throat> I put a red circle when we underspent. So every time we underspent, I put a red circle. And when you total this up for this 11 years, going to 2020, because that's changed a bit since I got here, which we, we had budgeted $55 million of need and we spent 42. So I don't know how to describe that. Is that a deficit? Did we save money? Did we underfund? We're still leaking? I mean, I've got, I got a roof on the Mansfield Orthopedics building that looks like it's, uh, I don't know, potato chips because it's so dry and just waiting for that to sort of leak. So we didn't really save this, but we really have to address this. <clears throat> and any capital way back then should probably double or triple the price of it, particularly this building. So I wanted to just go over that, the orthopedics discussion, and then I'm going to give it to Don, who is our excellent overview of quality. Um, here's a quick orthopedics discussion. So remember the hospital service area definition. This is the towns where our patients come from. Some of them are out of country, we have one. Out of state, we have 49 folks, um, which is great. And this is the county. So Lamoille County, we take care of about 62% of our business is Lamoille County. So when you, and, and this, it's funny, I left that in there. That doesn't match by a couple percent, but that's our high chart for where our service area comes from from the hospital. But here's a pie chart for Mansfield Orthopedics, just the Waterbury office. So if you look at the Waterbury office, uh, it's amazing how many people. So the graph on the right shows that literally 72% of the people in that reddish area who, who come, come to our office, 72% of the people that come to our Waterbury office are from South. 14% from sort of the kingdom in Franklin and only 14% are from here. So it's amazing how many people come to our Waterbury office to the point where we did, we are in the process of trying to build a more comprehensive office to keep people from uh, getting here sooner. But um, I thought that was interesting. And when it comes to issues of uh, quality and access in our strategic plan, there's two items that we're working on one of them is 
how do we work with our local primary care offices? We have two of them, our nursing home, designated agency for mental health, home health. All these folks to say, how do we manage care, make it more efficient, tighter? How do we consider sharing staff? And regionally, we're with a group, um, a new upstart group from a uh, community health network, community hospital network that we're trying to put together to help us locally within the state of Vermont and elsewhere to drive dental costs, be more efficient, and find ways to help each other, whether it's travelers or sharing staff, other staff. Don's going to talk about a couple things. I'm going to turn it over to Don. Uh, thanks. Uh, should I? Yeah, that looks good. Leave it on. Oh, this? Yeah, yeah no, this one's this, this one's good. Um, so I think this is my eighth year uh, at a budget uh, presentation. And uh, I think probably Dr. Holmes has been there for most of them, so she must be getting pretty, pretty tired of me. But I also get to see a different part of the Green Mountain Care Board. In the last couple of years, I've had the privilege of participating in two initiatives uh, of trying to get uh, a handle on how to really uh, look at both access and quality of uh, our hospitals in a way that's uh, actually you can you can reliably and repeatedly uh, measure and that's uh, somewhat robust. I, I think it's probably fair to say that the access part of that is still uh, a work in progress, but um, I think the quality part, uh, at least from someone like myself, who's been thinking and doing this for a while, uh, is pretty well understood, at least at a first pass um, uh, attempt. And so uh, this would be the uh, quick uh, summary of a uh, set of metrics for uh, hospital quality. Uh, I think it would probably start by acknowledging there are really two kinds of uh, data to work with. One is uh, basically the hard clinical data. That's when you're actually measuring something that actually happened. And then there are uh, data that's somewhat softer, more experiential, uh, basically asking people uh, kind of what they think. And so in that latter group, uh, we have the hospital report card uh, reported to us through the BDH, uh, particularly the, uh, the HCAPs. Uh, which are surveys sent to patients uh, who have recently been uh, in the hospital. And uh, through both uh, 23 and 22, uh, Copley has had uh, all five stars that can possibly be given uh, as a hospital. In 23, there was one other Vermont hospital that had five stars, Mount Escutney. And in 22, it was uh, just Copley. And through both of those years, for the two things that I think are probably most important when asked, uh, do you recommend the hospital to a friend or how do you rate this hospital? And, and what they really uh, pay attention to is if you rate it basically at a nine or a 10 out of 10, Copley's, Copley's always in the top three uh, through both of those. So I think that's uh, that along with the slide that Joe showed that so many of our patients come from outside of our, uh, what might be thought of as our natural uh, service area, uh, really says two things about us, that people really like coming up promptly. And uh, even though we, we don't advertise this or uh, aggressively get the word out, uh, people do know and they keep showing up. So moving on to uh, some harder data, the um, readmission data, they get this through uh, VAWS in fiscal year 21 and 22, Copley's average readmission rate is 7.7% uh, compared to the uh, critical access hospital average of 8.7% uh, and the all comers Vermont hospital average of 9.7%, uh, which also suggests that, that, that Copley's doing quite a good job really in two separate areas. Uh, one is that we're actually uh, doing a good job of caring for our patients and preparing them through discharge, but also that we're working well uh, with the rest of our community, the uh, local primary care offices and uh, uh, home health care. Uh, and basically, you need all those folks working together to really make a successful uh, discharge uh, work out. 
And last, but by no means least, there's the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, which is the gold standard in measuring uh, surgical quality. Uh, if you ever want, I, I can talk about this uh, for probably the better part of a day, but just uh, to give you the 30,000 uh, foot view on it, uh, I, I presented in this slide uh, two kinds of data. And this data is basically all surgical service data measuring uh, our all complication rate uh, over six years, 2017 to 2022. Uh, on the graph on the left, uh, that's raw data. Another way of thinking about that is that actually happens when you come to Copley or you go to uh, the average Nisquip hospital. And as you can see, uh, the chance of a complication when you come to Copley is very much lower than an average Nisquip hospital. Um, if you're wondering, like, what's an average Nisquip hospital, uh, they, for the most part, they have names like UVM and Dartmouth and MGH and Cedar sinai and hospitals of, uh, of those ilk. So uh, it's a pretty fast crowd that we seem to do quite well in comparison of. If uh, we had folks from UVM or Dartmouth or MGH sitting here at the table, they would have uh, they would have some yeah buts about that as they, they would tell you their patients are sicker and they do lots more cases and that that's really not a fair comparison. Uh, to them, I would say two things. I would say one is, well, yeah, you're, those are good points, but this is what actually happens when an actual person goes to our two hospitals. But also Nesquip has accounted for all those things on the, on the graph on the right. Uh, they have a rather complicated uh, statistical model that takes into account patient uh, factors and case numbers and case mix. Um, and I've uh, presented uh, the six years data for this along with the average of the six year, which is sort of the Harlequin thing uh, all the way on the right. And if, if your value uh, is one, uh, that means you're, you're average. And if it's below one, uh, that means you're better than average. And as you can see, our six year average is about 0.9. And that's with everything considered. Um, and I would also note that their statistical model also has a very uh, hard regression to the mean component to it. They don't actually believe, at least statistically, that uh, hospitals really are a lot better or a lot worse and that it's all sample error. I, I, I disagree strongly with that. But uh, even considering all that, uh, Copley still looks uh, really good. And uh, I would say that uh, we look good and it's consistent over many years. And somehow we seem to do all that having basically the lowest prices in the state. Um, and uh, as you know, because you pay a lot of attention to the money, uh, our ability to be uh, sustainable and to sustainably deliver this good care is at significant uh, risk, really, because our prices uh, are so low. So, um, I'm sure Karen and Liz are going to add to some of the questions when we get them and probably field a lot of that discussion, but we're open for conversation or what you'd like to talk about. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, we'll turn to uh, Director Sarah Lindbergh and she'll walk us through some of the data that she's pulled from the benchmarking tool. And then, um, you know, your team, Mr. Wooden, can jump in with any comments that you'd like as she goes. And then um, we'll uh, turn to board questions. Great, thank you. Um, are you able to see the screen? I'm in a little bit different environment. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. All right, fantastic. All right, so uh, we see for uh, NPR growth uh, that Copley among the critical access hospitals has the second uh, lowest growth in net patient revenue. Um, and we also see a pretty impressive amount of operating expense growth at 5%. Um, so managing those expenses, uh, I do know that some of the provider transfers uh, may be making some of this a little bit hard to compare. So um, I just wanted to make sure I followed one. So 
the the one of the transfers said it was from Mansfield Orthopedics to Mansfield Orthopedics. So I was trying to figure out how that works from a provider transfer standpoint vis-a-vis -vis the hospital. Yeah, so I can no, I she died. I, I can jump in. It's Dr. Uh, Dr. Arrows, and I think folks comment about this, but he made a decision of significance of leaving the organization. We were certainly surprised and heartbroken, and he is by far the most productive orthopedic surgeon that we have. Well loved, a lot of tears, uh, a lot of sadness, but he loves Dr. Arrows. And so we had to immediately figure out and make a commitment to get an additional provider. We've always had a backlog. We've always had greater demand and supply. Um, that news was pretty much jaw dropping. And so we went down that road, <clears throat> made that commitment. I will say in the process of him transitioning and managing that, um, there was always an outpouring of affection for good people and, you know, wanting them to think about staying and so forth. But it was pretty intense. It was extremely sincere. So him and his family, um, much later, made a decision and asked to, to come back to the hospital. And uh, he's a very wonderfully kind person. He's one of the nicest folks I know. The surgery department, no offense, Dr. Degree. <laughs> So we were sort of in a tough situation. We were thinking about that. We, we've we had demand that has far exceeded our supply. So that was the unexpected sort of transfer request that got jumped around. But thankfully, he's staying. We have a new, our first female orthopedic surgeon uh, starting in the next couple of months, finishing up a residency down in Boston. So we're very happy to welcome Dr. Erin Picciatino. So, that's kind of the discussion there. It was a gut-wrenching transition that uh, the community wrapped their arms around him and his family, and he decided to stay. So we're really thankful. Uh, so that's kind of that in a nutshell. I don't know if you guys want to add to that. Yeah, I guess I would just add right off that even with uh, Dr. Aero Stain and Dr. Picciatino coming, uh, waiting lists for particularly joint services at Copley are still going to be three to six months out. So, I mean, if we really did have a handle on, on access, it would still look like we're struggling to keep up. Okay. Um, this, so the, the other two transfers sounded more like what I traditionally think, like there's a community service that the hospital kind of helped fill. I, I just don't quite follow the orthopedic. So is this a, a new hire or is it like a new service? I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be dense. I just yeah, it was a it was a it was a replacement. It was intended to be a replacement for Dr. Arrow. So Aaron Picciutino, the commitments were made, and so that's how we got her, and she's going to be joining us. But I don't know, maybe Jeff can answer that. Yeah. So Sarah, after uh, we had hired. Um, which was really, I think, a testament to Copley. We were able to hire Dr. Picciatino very quickly. Um, and what then happened is then thereafter, Dr. Eros came back and said he would really like to stay. Um, and so that wasn't represented in our budgets. Only Dr. Picciatino was represented in our budgets. Okay, got it. Yep. Okay. Added, unexpected added provider. Okay. It was hard to say no to her, though. She's uh, she's going to be a great addition to the team. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, no, I understood. Okay, uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, and so, uh, looking at the finances over time, uh, you have a very uh, unusual uh, relationship between your operating expenses and NPR. So for most people, we see a, a bigger gap here and a heavier reliance on other operating revenue. So um, this is probably a testament to the lean and mean mentality. Um, but however, I do see this is very unusual, unfortunately, to see the orange line above the blue line. I don't know what that weird feedback is. Is it better now? <laughs> um, and so my, 
My main question is uh, related to operating margin. So a jump from negative one where you're um, forecasted or predict projected to end in 23 up to 3% in a 24 budget is a, is a pretty big jump in one year. So I was just wondering, you know, kind of your approach to that in building your budget. So building our budget uh, on the jump is one is, you know, getting our rates to at least be average. That's one big thing for us that we need to do. The other thing is working the, uh, the traveler expenses, getting those unnecessary expenses down below. Uh, where they need to be. Um, you know, our travelers, uh, they were at a high two years ago of $109 an hour. We're now averaging about 120. Um, our travelers were at a high of uh, um, just actually this fiscal year um, in the month of March of being uh, between 30 two and 35. We've got them down to 27 and we need to continue to keep on bringing them down. And so it's the relationship of uh, uh, managing our expenses, either be it through, you know, cost containment measures, working um, all the different uh, avenues that we can to get the expenses down, but get the revenue to be average. Got it. And, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, travelers have been our biggest challenge, unexpected, uh, the price differences went up as high as $200 an hour, the height of uh, COVID. And I know nationally, there are some hospitals spending over $10,000 a week for a nurse. So if you do the math on that, that's a half a million dollar job for a single nurse. So I know the country's been reeling on this. I know a lot of states have tried to put forth legislation to manage both the traveling companies, how much profit they make, as well as limiting staff from jumping. I know Missouri this year actually made a go at that. And I hope that's something maybe the state of Vermont could look at because we went from zero to a hundred in terms of expense. And it's not desirable for us because we just keep having new people join. We've got to train them, acclimate them. I know operationally it's been very challenging, but I don't know if Karen wants to add to that. I would say that uh, we've really tried to take a different route on that. Um, when we get travelers in, we, they're, we're very particular about who we bring in. Um, we're looking for a good match for the facility. And then once staff get here, we try to treat them exceptionally well, so they'll stay. Uh, and we don't have that additional cost of uh, breaks in between contracts where you're running under, um, as well as the cost of counting on someone coming and then them canceling their contract at the last minute. We've also converted quite a few travelers who are now permanent staff here. Uh, so we continue to try to go down that route, recruit and retain everywhere we can. Yeah, we've we've heard that once or twice. Um, always <laughs> easier to a lot easier to say, I think, than than uh, yes. execute. <laughs> um, so, and here we see um, this is unusual to see a, a jump in salaried folks between 21 and 22. I'm guessing that might have something to do with some provider transfer, but uh, might be off the mark there. And uh, again, seeing that in terms of compensation, if we trend forward where you were on a per FTE basis uh, to date, um, you're basically right in line with what the cost inflation is. So maybe even a little low. So um, any kind of thoughts about uh, this or related information? Yes, yeah, Sarah, um, my apologies. Uh, when we did see this, when your data tool came out, we did look into it. And so what we discovered is in 2021, there wasn't traveler FTEs reported in that number. In 2022, there was, and that goes back to that 30. Got it. Okay. And another testament to our data model uh, needing a little tune-up. So thank you. Okay. Um, yep. So despite having the travelers in there, you still see the per FTE go down. So despite those challenges, that's that's uh, that's. I'm surprised to see that trajectory. Um, what was up with the utilization in 21? You guys like blew off the doors according to what we've got here. Is that also maybe some restructuring or yeah, any ideas what might be going on there? Yeah, um, you know, having this organization shut down due to COVID um, was insane. 
And there was a lot of pent up demand and um, our providers, um, our staff really stepped up to it and the patients did return in regards to the surgical volumes. We, it was pretty amazing right at the end. We were the first hospital back up and running with inpatient cases. The very first day the governor lifted the ban. We, You're ready to roll, yeah. We were ready to roll, yep. And yeah. we, were the last, we were the last hospital to follow the governor's recommendation also. Uh, we just had people that really wanted to work and uh, we were extremely busy once things lifted. Yeah, we've just, just been very busy. Surgeons uh, and teams. Yeah. It, Oh, I'm sorry. I know that, um, you know, as more and more services shifting to outpatient, which tends to be a little trickier to try to um, plan for um, how you kind of handle that uncertainty. I, I know with the flood, you guys were pretty seamless in your response and able to not really skip any beats. So um just curious kind of how you, you know, prepare for those kind of ebbs and flows and case flow like that. Well, um, just on the on the um, outpatient stuff we'll see in future data, our orthopedic team on their own, they're, they're really self-driving. They got their own attitude about quality and operations, and it's great. They really want to do the best next thing, and they've been talking about doing outpatient joints. And um, they sort of pressed us before COVID hit. Like, we really want to get on this, and we wanted to study it. We were trying to understand the finances. But once uh, COVID started to unfold, people didn't want to be inpatient. People didn't want to be at the hospital. So our outpatient orthopedics business, and uh, I'm sure you can attest to this, really yeah. has taken off. We, it's amazing how much we do outpatient. Yeah, I think uh, prior even to COVID, um, in response to patient desire, um, we were hearing from patients asking if we did outpatient surgery. At that point, we did a very small number of our patients outpatient. Um, we really did not have a robust program, which needs to be multidisciplinary. It's not just surgeons deciding they want to send patients home. Uh, it starts at the time of their initial visit. We have to include PCPs in that, physical therapy, our pharmacy department, anesthesia. It's very uh, complex. And so uh, as a group, we pulled our steering committee together and we started working on that before COVID even hit. Um, again, in response to patient requests, but also seeing an increase in our inpatient volume. Uh, we were starting to see borders in the ED um, and we were starting to look at what are we going to do if the house is full with medical patients and we have no place to admit our surgical patients. Uh, the vast majority of our inpatient surgical patients were total joints. So those two things dovetail together very nicely. And so we really were well underway in that program. We were probably through our second iteration of um, what our protocols look like. And then COVID hit and I had surgeons in anesthesia available for big long meetings because they weren't operating anymore. <laughs> and we got that program up and running so that when we opened our doors, we completely flipped our inpatient and outpatient model. And uh, from the time we opened till now, we're at 97% of all of our total joints, hips, knees, and shoulders, and ankles go home same day. It's pretty remarkable. That's amazing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, without, this is the first time I've seen this data, so I don't know exactly what's being measured with <clears throat> the word utilization, but for sure, several things happened at the same time. One was, when was the outpatient joints, which I, we lead the state in, Anyway, so other you wouldn't see that in other hospitals data, and I think that's just added on to, uh, as you may recall from the from the COVID years, uh, even important things like mammograms and colonoscopies they stopped being done uh, entirely. So as soon as we started it again, there was a huge, uh, basically, uh, backlog of uh, of things that really needed to be attended. So I think what you're probably seeing with that spike. I mean, it would be our best guess since we don't know exactly what it is, uh, is the combination of those two things. And if and if our spike's a little higher than most people's, I think that's why. Yeah, yeah, that, and just here to understand. So I, I appreciate yeah. your perspective. Yeah. The final thing is, is we also, uh, um, you know, as an organization, I think you hear that a lot of organizations are uh, um, 
choosing new EMRs, um, you know, and uh, converting over to new EMRs. Um, Copley was in a, a similar situation. We needed to understand what we needed to do. Um, but instead of going out and changing over from our current system to a brand new system, we actually did what we call the refresh around that time frame too. Um, and that is where we took CPSI, we created a new version of CGSI, and uh, um, some of our stats did change um, and uh, um, could also be contributing to those numbers kind of spiking up. Okay. okay. Um, and then I think you kind of covered a lot of this, uh, you know, as far as events go, um, a lot of uh, in migration, I think our HSA is going to be a lot different than how you think of your catchment area. Um, but uh, also notably, uh, just seeing a very high proportion uh, compared to some other HSAs of Medicaid spending in that HSA. Um, so just kind of a, you know, that's a, a the whole HSA, so not just Copley Hospital, um, but just seeing that that's kind of an unusual dis distribution of the uh, dollar share for Medicaid. So, you know, part of that might be those low prices that's keeping the commercial bars low. Um, and so uh, you assume the 6.6% uh, inflationary growth from 23 to 24, um, and I, I meant to ask ahead of time, but um, hoping to get a sense of what the um, realized uh, expense growth is estimated to be from 22 to 23, and I can follow up, Jeff, if you don't have that at your fingertips. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, um, the expense growth, um, we actually used Vizian through NIA. Mm -hmm. um, they communicated 6.6, uh, uh, or it was slightly lower than that. But yeah, we can definitely follow up and give you the exact number. But that was uh, um, supplied by our group um, purchasing uh, um, um, agent. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we'll be reaching out, I think, to all the hospitals just to get a little bit more granular on some of the variation in other cost inflation. Um, so, again, looks like you um, used the group pur purchasing organization. We just didn't see too much detail about what you were uh, budgeting in some of the other buckets. Um, okay, and then when we go to the cost report, uh, we see as of fiscal year 22, um, this, this adjusted discharges measure, which is certainly imperfect, as a lot of us in the biz know that it's hard to count outpatient events, so we use this adjusted discharge, and we see that you're kind of at the top of the whisker, so um, the middle here would be the 50 50th percentile, half the data in the peer group is above that. Half the data is below it. Here we've got the 25th percentile, the 75th percentile, and this upper whisker is Copley. Um, we also see that you have a higher uh, acuity. I presume that has to do with the orthopedic share of your services having a higher CMI. But um, now that you're moving to the outpatient Thanks, setting, <laughs> I want to make sure that I've got that right. You've got that right. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm, not so I'm not so sure. Is that inpatient? Yes. So it's it's going to be DRG payments, so DRG weights. So are, even though you're in the outpatient setting, are we still going to get it on a CMS 50, uh, UBO, UBO4? I'm sorry. If it, if it counts outpatient, then yeah, that probably is right. Historically, okay. we had a very high CMI because we admitted all the joints we did. But, but since we haven't been doing that, we would have thought our CMI would be going down quite a bit. And uh, it, although I think it's gone down a bit, it hasn't gone down as much as we thought, I think just because sicker patients are coming into the hospital now. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and that, you know, that acuity is above the 75th percentile. So that would, you know, in, in, uh, assume some more intensive services. Um, and yet we see that you, I believe, are, uh, come on. 16. 16%. There you go. That's right. 16%. So, uh, yeah. What, what do you think that's about? Just going to say it's accurate. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I think it's great. I love that chart. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, nobody, you know, I, I'm not on some of these charts. I'm not sure how to manage that. I'm not sure. You, you know what I mean? Like we, we don't think about how to perform best with the ratio of administrative and general salaries to clinic salaries. You, you get what I'm saying? So I, I can appreciate it. Of course, I like it because it makes us look good, but I don't, I, I'm not sure what to say about it. 
I do want to go back to the uh, case mix index one, just an interesting subject and maybe Karen or Liz has thoughts, but when we went to so much outpatient on one of our biggest services in the volume and the amount, you would think that our inpatient hospital would just be empty and the hospital would be like, wow, so your census must plummet. And yet for our ER, the types and volumes of patients that we're seeing in our ER and the volume and the types of acuity, it's interesting that we don't feel any less busy. Certainly, I don't think Liz feels less busy in the ER, nor does the floor, right? I, did I get that right? Yeah, I mean, you you said it exactly. I think those of us that are on the floor and appreciating that are really realizing that there's just more patients and there's a higher acuity. You know, by 2030, all boomers will be 65 or older, and that is a huge population that, you know, also tags on to what resources are available. Um, you know, we when we budgeted for the amount of visits that we were going to have, you know, we if you look at you pulled up you had a graph earlier about you know the number of ED visits being at twelve thousand and a little higher and then a little higher and then it dropped off, which was COVID because people stayed home, they didn't want to see us, and that you know and the ones that were coming to see us were really sick and really high acuity. And I think had we you know projected through 20 and 21 to right now, we would have continued to go up and potentially um, budgeted for the numbers that we're actually seeing now, which is, you know, like I said, at this point, we're at 14,000, um, but we've budgeted under that. So we're really just seeing so many more patients that we um, have to keep for longer, which it was amazing to switch over to an outpatient um, process for a lot of these joints, they do a lot better, but it also decompressed upstairs and it really just worked timing wise to help us out because I don't, you know, three years ago we were, you know, playing a one for one game, leaving the ER with no admissions, which isn't realistic because the ER is the only place that we can't turn people away or stop treating them um, or let them go somewhere else. So we really just continue to see that increase. Um, the millennials is the next biggest group, and they are the ones that are having these compounded stays and related to mental health and substance issues as we run out of access to help them get out of the ER. But again, the ER is the only place that we have to keep them and we have to treat them, um, and they have extended stays continuing to put patients in the hallway um, or in rooms without technically staffed beds. Um, so I think just when we talk about what do we want to budget for, we realistically should be budgeting for, and that's you know essentially what we've done an eval for, is how do we kind of jump from 2019 to where we should be right now to make sure that our census and our acuity matches essentially the quality that we want to give. You're right, it should be number one on our list of things, but realistically, as we're all sitting here, we really have to be financially stable to do that, and right now it's hard. Yeah. That feels like an understatement. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so as far as uh, cash, we've already kind of talked about your challenges to re rebuild some of the cash that you have on hand. Uh, seeing you, you know, pretty close to the 25 percentile, it not probably not congruent with that uh, financial stability uh, that you're talking about. Uh, and then for, you know, I, I almost hate to call it profitability in 22, but, um, you know, seeing you near the median as, as low as that is, uh, is, uh, wondering if that has to do with, uh, this outcome, which, uh, is just a bit abo below the median. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That was Gifford. Uh, you are right there with Gifford though, um, at 11,000, uh, per discharge. So again, this is claims data, uh, for each average, uh, cost uh, allowable by Medicare um, adjusted for your CMI, we get about 11,000 per discharge, um, which, uh, you know, is uh, one of the most impressive among the critical access hospitals in Vermont and is between the 25th and 50th percentile uh, in this distribution. Um, so cost coverage, this one, um, I think, I definitely, well, here, why don't we look? So if we look overall, we see um, that inpatient uh, just decreasing, um, given what you said about your service mix. I wonder if part of that um, might be the shift to the outpatient setting and that we're seeing it kind of move there. See how this line goes down about the same, even more dramatically, but this is 
rising. So that might be if I had to guess what was going on here, but uh, also seeing a pretty uh, steady downward trajectory on the inpatient rates from Medicaid, uh, Vermont Medicaid. And we see here um, that at 57%, uh, that is the lowest cost coverage in fiscal year 22 for inpatient. Um, and seeing also very low cost coverage uh, on commercial. And so then when we look over to the outpatient side, uh, we see, you know, more, uh, a little bit higher cost, but not, not you know, pretty close to peers um, and a pretty close to peers payment, uh, but covering 189% of that allowable cost for commercial um, versus the 76% for Medicaid, which was one of the, um, you know, higher cost coverages on that side. So um, this one looks real funky to me when it averages out. <laughs> um, we see that overall the commercial being 160% of the cost, but still seeing a very low cost coverage uh, for Medicaid um, and a, a low payment. So, um, so you know, at, when I look at the the typical payment for commercial, the the height of that bar is pretty similar uh, among uh, these few hospitals. Um, so I'm just I, I know you. you seems like at least from a charge perspective that um, you're making up for lost time or feel like you're behind. But I guess here it, it looks like it might um, be getting better for at least from an allowed uh, amount, which we know that the patient share isn't always collected. Um, but just, you know, curious if uh, this perspective, uh, how that jives with kind of this uh, low price over time uh, that you've given us lots of data about. Yes. Yeah, so does that surprise you or you think there might be something funky going on? I'm just curious your kind of perspective on oh, this. There. When I looked at the uh, on this and I went down to uh, the bottom three graphs, exactly what you said. It's uh, um, it's basically a shifting out of the uh, um, inpatient orthopedic procedures into outpatient orthopedic procedures. In regards to the cost report, that had a pretty dramatic uh, effect on our cost report. And we're uh, working through that. That's what you're seeing there. Okay, uh, and then uh, so here we have again a standardized price per inpatient stay, and we see uh, for inpatient Copley again this is 18 through 20. So um, especially given the changes in your uh, the setting of the most of your uh, service, this might not be <laughs> very informative at all. But at that time anyway, you were right at the median. Uh, so again, what we do here sum up all of the pay, uh, commercial payments we have in the, the all-payer claims database, divide by standardized unit of service to try to get to an apples to apples. Um, and then we see you actually quite uh, below the 25th percentile in that time period on the outpatient side. So I would imagine probably this is now, if not at the median, uh, you know, closer to the median, and this is probably dropped down uh, given that. But again, we, we won't see that updated analysis for a while. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. So how does this relate to just the prices that are published or not? Jeff did most all of this data, of course, him and the staff. Like, how do, how do these charts relate to the fact that somebody is selling this service for $100 and other people are selling it on average for $300 and some of them are selling it for $1,000? Like, how does the basic, you know, we've got this disclosure of prices in America, the public understands that, we understand that, but then we go through these machinations and it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. And it's like, oh my gosh, but what we're seeing, and I don't know if we collect people's bills, I mean, I don't know how, you have any suggestions on how we can better understand our prices because they seem dramatically low. Yeah, and I think that's one of the, the tricky things about um, how we look at charges versus the allowed amount, right? And like, we're yeah. pretty weak on understanding the allowed amount in an apples to apples fashion. So that that is why I think, you know, there can be some value to these machinations, but uh, still imperfect. <laughs> yes, I know when I first got here, I've uh, been here four years, um, I found that in the charge master, and you, you know what charge masters are, it's important, you look at them, but in our charge master, we had a number of cases where 
we would bill less than the allowed amount. And um, hopefully a few people are gasping, in the room, but uh, you know, it's, it's not possible for insurance companies. They will pay you the lesser of your charges or the allowed amount. We were actually charging less than the fee schedule and just leaving money on the table. So folks like Blue Cross and MVP would just kind of giggle and say, oh my gosh, Copley's really funny. Um, so I just think the prices and uh, what's allowed, you know, the fixed fee schedules, I think we really all need to understand that because at the end of the day, that's what a patient gets for a bill. Like, like oh my gosh, your MRI, you know, is so inexpensive or it's so expensive, you know, you would hope that we would give the community or the public a sense that we've controlled these, give or take 10%, so a 20% swing, or give or take 20%, so a 40% swing. But we, we have a system where the public can literally get charged, as you saw in just one, you know, 900% more from going from one place to another. And, and these are thousands of dollars. I mean, that one example was like four thousand dollars more. I'm just yeah. throwing it out because I don't understand it, and I wish we would understand how that works. All of yeah. us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost um, if it were uh, obfuscated by design for some reason. <laughs> yep. Uh, but yeah, I think that that's exactly right. Uh, is that um, yeah, it's it's a very uh bizarre market no one I don't think would uh, draw this up on purpose and uh, look forward to working together to try to get that right sized and uh, yeah. scrutable scrutable to a consumer yeah that, that was all I had I don't know if there's anything else you want to comment on from the data portion before we turn it over to the board for their questions no I think we're good All right. Um, thank you, Director Lindbergh. Uh, I'll open it up. Um, there's no set order, so any board member that has any question or comment, please go ahead. I can go ahead and go first. Um, hi, all. I hope you're doing well. Um, I was yeah. wondering how you thought about uh, Medicaid redeterminations and whether you included some assumptions related to that in your budget. Yeah, um, with the uh, redeterminations, we did, you know, through our contractuals have, um, you know, some assumptions that are built in. Um, this is a wait and see for us. Um, you know, we're expecting, hopefully, um, that we do a spectacular job of uh, getting those individuals onto a commercial um, plan through the exchange, but we're also understanding that we'll probably see them come into our charity care and even as well as our bad debt. So could you explain what those assumptions that you included are? So what we did is, you know, working with like, you know, specifically one care, um, you know, we did reach out, ask them what they thought uh, on, you know, on, the uh, um, changeover was going to be. They did communicate to us that it was um, it's coming on a little bit quicker than they expected, uh, but we kind of used them as a guide to get to where we needed to get to. So basically, you took the uh, change in the Medicaid fixed price amount that One Care will be providing, passing through to you, and then used that as your assumption for your other. Medicaid related business, am I understanding that right? Yes, but uh, and you know, but the thing is, is where it actually ends up is going to be the question. That's going to be a wait and see. Sure. That we don't, yeah. Sure. So you um, did you also apply that same assumption to your bad debt free care? Right now, you will see that the bad debt and free care we use the historical trends for those. Uh, we have it built into our Medicaid number. Okay, got it. Thank you for explaining that. Um, in uh, the answers to some of the staff questions, you outlined several expense reduction efforts that you've been pursuing. Um, is it possible to quantify sort of your expected savings so we can get a, just a, a sense of those dollar amounts, either if it's in the past, what you were able 
to save and if it's in the future what you're expecting. And obviously, if you can't do that now, that can be a follow up. I think that if we could take that as a follow up, uh, um, it would be tricky. A lot of them are more of uh, processes that we put in place. You know, um, looking at our contracts, making sure that everybody's touching the appropriate contracts. We do that with our capital as well. You know, it's not just, uh, um, I always love it. Um, you know, if your budgets go through, um, people kind of think that, okay, great, now I can get FTEs or now I can buy my capital. That is not the case. We always make sure that we're uh, diligent and we look at uh, where our volumes are and, you know, um, where the, uh, the uh, um, organization is before we approve that. So we put a lot of processes in place. I'll Thank just, sort of, I'll just yeah, sort of, uh, jump in, Robin, thanks. So yeah. um, the travelers uh, and our efforts to retain staff Crew staff, and a big part of that relates to our salaries, our benefits, and making sure that we are competitively attractive. There's a variety of things that we need to do to do that. Our straight salaries are part of that. Um, we're looking at trying to reduce our travelers by about 33% from our current number, but I can't, I can't predict that. And when Liz and the ED has got holes in her schedule, you know, this point where it's like you can't run an emergency department with significantly understaffed. You just can't do it. I mean, there's a line in the sand that he would come to me as would Karen and say, listen, we just can't do this. So we've got our goal of a 33% reduction in our travelers. We're going to try to meet that. If we're a little bit slow on the beginning, we're going to have to maybe be more aggressive on the end. We'd like to get to no travelers, but it is by far the biggest expense supply chain efforts. We're looking at other options, even that group that I talked about in the state to see if we could uh, save money on supply chain efforts, contract review process, capital review, revenue, capturing revenue and improving our you know, charge capture process. We, we, don't, we don't have dollar amounts on many of these because it's just hard to sort of say we're going to do that. We are trying though, like on the traveler side, but I know um, I mean, there are people that come to us and say, yeah, I'm going to, I got a job as, you know, hardworking people that have been here for many years and say, yeah, I'm going to go traveling in Vermont. I get to come home at night. I get to see my kids. You know, it's just too much money not to leave you. And when it happens, I mean, it is really painful, you know, and um, that problem continues with us. And some people come to us from other hospitals too, so I can't complain. It's a one-way door. Some people will say, well, you guys need travelers, so I'm going to quit working at Hospital X and I'm going to come work for you. And it just doesn't feel good for any of us. It feels horrible, you know, on either side. So I don't know the traveling. I don't know if you have any ideas or thoughts or you want to add anything to that. I mean, I think for all of us really, you know, living here and working here, um, really working on the recruitment and retention, which like you said, we're all kind of hammering in. Um, travelers is not a problem that just we're facing. And to, you know, to Joe's point, we do have a lot of travelers that come here and um, live locally and just, you know, they can get more as a traveler, which I think for healthcare, when we're trying to say what's realistic as a budget and we as a nation have to figure out what to do together to really, help healthcare continue moving forward, it really is making your area someplace that people want to stay and tip the scale from what you can make as a traveler hourly to I really enjoy working here and will make a reasonable wage. Um, so having the right um, resources, and I, I feel like I've been a little bit of a challenge coming into this team with, you know, looking at what we've done for the last couple of years and what we really need to do in the next couple of years to make um, the workflow change. We've done some great changes in the ER to realign um, back to some standards set by our national organizations for standards of care, but we are still very much far behind it. And that's not going to come without increases in what we need, we need the department um, from the hospital and if it's not there it's really hard to keep up and it's really hard to say we give this great quality of care that people want to we have 10 hours of the day where there's only two nurses staffed in that er that's our staffing pattern currently um you know with that comes a request in ftes um because again two nurses 
that have a lot of productivity throughout the rest of the hospital and, and quote unquote take care of the sick of the sickest includes a charge nurse or a team lead as we call it here. So there's not a nurse sitting around the corner that you know can pop in. So realistically to um, to kind of, for me at least rebuild where someone like me who's been doing this for 14 years and I want to be here and I live here and I want to give good care to my, um, my colleagues and my community, um, we have to realign that so that it's a, it's a good place to work where we all feel safe. And I think the ER, we talk about all of the issues in the ER that we can't avoid. Um, there are some things that we can do to make it better. And it's just an investment. I think the scales will tip when we start making changes for a little bit higher wages for what we're doing. Um, you know, Kathy brought up in the first meeting that you can go down the street and make um, more money working at Dem's place making bagels, or I took a little break after COVID and I made more money bartending two days a week than I do nursing with three degrees for three days a week. So, you know, the big picture wise, that's that's really hard to figure out how do you scale back on travelers, but make it a good place to work where we can all survive. Thanks. Um, I know a lot of the other hospitals have been focused on grow your own programs. I don't know if that's something that you have currently implemented or have thought about. So, uh, yeah, we've done a couple uh, significant things. We are now a uh, clinical site for DTC. They're nursing. We are, you know, bring in nursing students here. Copley uh, is now uh, one of the hospitals that where they send their students for clinical. Um, and then on top of that, we've started a nurse residency program uh, to try to compete with some of the larger hospitals that do the same thing. Um, so you can take a new, fresh new grad and put them through a residency program, um, which is, you know, a, an extended orientation, uh, really. And then we have year long uh, extensions to residency programs for our specialty areas, like the operating room and the emergency room. Um, OR nurses and ED nurses do not grow on trees. They're very hard to find. Um, you know, you can hire a brand new grad onto med surge uh, pretty easily. Um, and, uh, you know, routinely you find um, travelers high in those specialty areas. And up until uh, two years ago, we have a standard of five OR nurses uh, in our uh, operating room here to run our three ORs. We have five uh, nurses and three of those nurses were travelers for almost a full year. And we hired three young nurses out of the VTC program, uh, put them through a year long residency, paid for them to go through the Association of Operating Room Nurses program as well. That was an added expense for us. But these are local women who want to stay close uh, and who are flying on their own and doing a great job. But, you know, that was a year long commitment of paying both them uh, the cost of their program and a traveler to backfill them because they were learning on the on the job and you had to have, you know, a working nurse beside them, um, which goes back to why we're one of the reasons why we have to be so particular about our travelers is we are so tightly staffed the travelers sometimes are helping us orient and train new nurses here. Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions related to the commercial contracts, but I think those are likely uh, necessary to go into executive session. So I was thinking I would hold those for others to ask their questions. Chair Foster. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, I have. Just a couple myself, so I'll just jump in here. Um, well, first, I wanted to comment that, you know, I know you have felt that it's difficult given the rate increases that you have not received, but I will say the positive of that is I think it looks really great for the state and for Copley that you have kept your costs down. Your operating expenses have been kept low. Your 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 data looks good. So there there is a benefit and I know it's been maybe not as easy as one would hope, but we appreciate how well you've controlled those expenses. So thank you for doing that. Um, the one question I had was on the budget cuts that were in um, your opening statements, were, were any of those enforcement based or were they all just in the budget hearing process? 
Are you talking about the budget cuts to rate increase or to capital that we chose uh, specifically? What, which, what are you looking for? To rate increases. Those were uh, um, Green Mountain Care Board, us going in asking for X rate, and then uh, um, after deliberations, that was the rate that we received. Okay, they weren't a performance year, then a, a cut because of the... No. Not, okay. No, it was, I mean, there, it's, it's not your history, a lot of people on the board, it's not mine, but if you go back, it's just surprising, like it probably came I think they had years of not asking for enough, but even some of the recent years going back, they asked for zero, they got negative 3.4. They asked for zero, they got negative. You know, I mean, there it was pretty dramatic in terms of how little, you know, and when you cut that much, I mean, the, our, our biggest problem is we're running a negative operating margin for seven years if you don't count the COVID money. So maybe six years, it's a lot. It's it's not sustainable. I mean, we're we're not a going concern to even give us loans so that we can improve our cash because people look at operating margin and cash. If you're light on both sides, we don't look attractive. It's kind of a downward spiral. So I, I appreciate the accolades. I wish I could afford them. <laughs> uh, you know, and maybe there's stuff we can learn or, you know, I, I'm always thinking strategy, like, what are we doing wrong? Is there something wrong with our IT system? Is there something wrong? You know, I mean, I'm trying to look around, like, what is it that would make such an orthopedic hospital, specialty hospital to just be performing below lackluster? Like that, I, I don't know that answer. Oh, and I'm still looking for that. Right. Um, yeah. In terms of the grow your own programs and the nurse residency program, what when, when did those start? We've now graduated two classes, so two years ago we started. Um, our entire nurse education department is two people. Um, and one of those people works primarily for BTC. They're their clinical instructor. Um, so we started, I think the first year we only had four students, uh, four nurses in the program and we've expanded it, uh, this, this past year to seven, I think made it all the way through. Yeah. Oh, just, oh, just a couple of things and then Don's going to jump in. So we, we now use EMTs in the ER, yeah. right? Which we never did to keep the cost down. So this has been trialing that we pilot these things to see if they work to keep costs down. Our nurse managers, many of them are taking shifts and actually pitch in. I know Liz sometimes comes in on weekends, if not nights, to fill holes. So we are asking a lot of leadership and they're doing that. The house supervisors actually will pitch in. I think we're really asking people and they've been very gracious to sort of see what they can do to help out. So our um, some other examples is Dr. Kunin. Adam Kunin, our cardiologist, is being contracted as a 0.5 FTE to Northwest Medical Center. That's part of the VCAN process. So we have, uh, you know, we've contracted out our one of our cardiologists part time there. Our CNO is actually the CNO and COO at Springfield Hospital. So we've contracted her to help out. It helps me on the cost side. People become very flexible. They learn a lot. They they get perspective. So those are a few I can think of, I'll have to think of others, but we really try to, it's not one answer, but everybody pitch in, what can we do? We know labor is our biggest expense, but how do we make sure that we're, you know, asking everybody without just hiring? But at the end of the day, we still have to hire. We still need people, but you're going to comment. Yeah, as far as the, uh, the, the grow your own, um, it, it sort of, it, there's a lot of different faces to grow your own. Copley's been a clinical site for Norwich and DTC for both RN and uh, LPN nurses for, for a long time. I, mean, I, def I remember when they all got sent home during COVID. In retrospect, that's kind of hard to understand, but it uh, seemed like the thing to do at the time. And uh, these, programs are, they're, these programs are tough for a, a small hospital that does generally try to run as lean as 
we can while keeping our quality where we think it's uh, acceptable. But we've had a long commitment toward that, and we've really done nothing but make uh, our commitment and involvement kind of more robust and more rich. And we have a lot of, lots, maybe four or five nurses now uh, that are integral to our operations that started out as medical assistants or basically runners, you know, years ago. And um, we, I'm just remembering on some things. So we've shared chaplaincy services mm -hmm. with the home health and hospice. Kathy can adjust. We, yeah. we do so much of this, we don't really think about it. And also some quality work we've sort of shared. So, so to help you out with quality. We've shared staff with the manor, the nursing home across the street. I mean, we do try to pitch in without just like hiring somebody uh, as much as possible. Um, uh, probably also did a nurse's aid program too. Yeah, and and they allowed my staff from home health to come and be part of that class. So they trained them. So not only did they gain nurse's aids, I also did. So it was a good collaborative. Yeah approach to, and that program is run two or three times, I know. Yes, we run the program three times now. Yes. Uh, we've sent a couple uh, local um, kids off to Scrub Tech School, um, happily paid for them to go um, with the commitment that they would come back and work with us. Uh, two of them, one of them uh, we sent out of our kitchen, another one I plucked out of the community per se. Um, they got into the excellent program over in Concord, um, and we committed to uh, paying for that program for them, um, and now they're working with us here. Um, we're actively looking at someone in our lab who would like to expand her horizons that we're also going to do the same thing, send them to Scrub Tech School. So, um, you know, we're constantly looking for ways to keep people motivated to stay here as well. We are unionized uh, environment for nurses, and so we have to stay within the con Finds of our contract, but we've done all kinds of things like create things called flex positions where if you're somebody that used to work in the emergency department, but now you work over in the recovery room, uh, we'll give you a flex position, which pays you a dollar more an hour if you're going to be, if you would be willing to flow back over to the emergency department and work if they were, um, you know, tightly, more tightly staffed over there. So we're constantly trying to work uh, with union leadership to come up with ways to keep people motivated um, and to stay here uh, and to grow professionally. Um, you know, we're a small place, but there's lots of, we're trying to make lots of opportunity here for people so that they don't feel like they have to leave. Um, yeah, and I, I keep, like, we, we don't keep a running list. We just try to do this because we have to, but I know that we, uh, not only do the birthing center nurses sometimes flat out, float out to med surge, but we actually place non expecting moms in the birthing center when they're not busy. So we bring them up to relieve Liz's area because she's like, you got to help me out. And so we put people in our birthing center all the time and have the nurses float back and forth. So I will say that the union leadership, the staff, we all get along. We actually figure this stuff out. There's not a dire, you know, tension between the union and us. We're all trying to figure it out to make sure the hospital stays vibrant. We can take care of patients. So. I just want to put that plug in because everybody really being flexible. In a lot of places, they don't float between disciplines like that. Most hospitals do not. Yeah, it seems like you're really innovating and doing a lot with what you got, and that's where it does pull through in your numbers. I mean, it, it does. So that's great. Um, shifting gears just a little bit, one of the statutory factors the board um, in our statute for review is, is marketing costs. I don't think we've requested it necessarily, but could you, as a follow-up, could you send me um, any data you have on the marketing spend? Absolutely. The marketing is not an allowable, is it an allowable cost in the cost reports? Some of it is, but development is not, right? Yeah, raising advertising. Yeah, average, so some stuff is, some stuff isn't. I will bring up a age old suggestion I've always had that, um, because I care about your job and what you do, because I'm a I'm new to the state. I've only been here 40 years, but I consider myself, you know, committed to Vermont. 40 years is maybe enough. Uh, I care about my tax money and then the somewhat thankless work that you guys have. So I do want you to be successful, all of us. But I think the idea of having a single auditor, because I've listened to a lot of hearings and I've seen stuff over the years where 
you always end up saying, well, what did you do with this expense? Or what did you do with this revenue? Where did you put your 403B revenue? And there was a hospital for years that put the 403B revenue. 340B, sorry, they're so close. 340B, they put it below the line, right? Yeah, so for years, a hospital is putting 340B revenue below the line. Now, I don't know if anybody knows what that means. Maybe Sarah does, but it's like, wow, you put all that below the line, but nobody caught it. And so I'm a real proponent to say you ought to have an outside audit firm, and maybe we should all pay for it, but you, you, you're asking great questions, but so much... So often you're like, oh, you guys interpret it differently. So, oh, and your question's great, um, but the definition of what's considered, you know, what marketing or advertising, again, um, it would be nice if that was really clean for all of us. Thanks yeah. for listening. No, I think that's a fair suggestion. It seems like there's a fair amount of uh, variation between how people account for things, and I think it's a fair yes. suggestion. Um, okay, well, yeah, I'd appreciate that. Uh, if you guys can follow up on it, if you have it after this, um, I, I don't have anything else. And, and thank you guys very much. Maybe I'll jump in. I have a couple of quick questions. How are you all? Good, thanks. Good. Um, I'm wondering if you, and this is, I, I suspect this is a follow up question as well. And I, uh, Sarah alluded to it already in her conversation, but. If you could unpack, so your your delta on your expense operating expenses is about fourteen percent from from uh, fiscal year twenty three budget, and I'm wondering if you can break out what of uh, that like do a little anatomy of it. What is from utilization, and then what is cost inflation? So, you know, what are your assumptions about wage growth for your existing employees? You know, medical and non medical. What are what are your supply inflation assumptions about uh, both medical and non-medical supplies, utilities, purchase services, pharmacy, all of that. So we can really understand the uh, cost inflation, the price component of it separately from the utilization component. I think it would be really helpful for us to understand the 14% increase. And also, uh, if you've got a way to think about it from actual, or, you know, projected fiscal year 23 to fiscal year 24, that would be helpful as well. Yeah, uh, Jessica, can I ask, kind of like that old schedule that used to, uh, you know, here's where you are, go through, make all the changes. Yes. Yeah, that was really helpful to me. That was that I could, you know, follow the numbers there. So that would be really helpful. Thank you. What happened to that old schedule? It wasn't asked for this year. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, I know. I know because I've got some numbers in front of me, but I know on the, uh, you know, the staff salary increases, they're significant because uh, we had a, three-year contract review uh, for nursing right as COVID just started and then another hospital close by with a lot of staff had their review and uh, they were 300 percent higher per year than us so the pressure on us from some hospitals you know, really throwing a lot of money is going to come due it's coming due uh, we, we we have no choice it's pressure. it's pressure on all of us. Yeah. On all of us, right. It spills. It's thank all, you, Kathy. It's all shop. community partners. It's, yeah. yeah, so. CVMC just unionized, I'm sure you're aware of, uh, less than a week ago. So uh, we are just entering a uh, negotiation year here. Our contract is up at the end of the year and we'll be uh, in negotiations. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see what happens. You know, they're pretty close to us. Um, and you know, see what happens with their salaries for nurses there, and how that'll affect our negotiations here with our union. Uh, yeah, and if, if uh, some of this information you need to, because it's, you're about to embark on negotiations with your union, have to be submitted in confidence. I think there's our legal team can evaluate that, but I, it would be really helpful for us to understand where is this yeah. expense growth coming from. Yeah, that's from a big buckets. part of it. That's one of them. Yeah, that that pressure is pretty destabilizing. Yeah, it's dramatic, the differences, much like the charges and prices. Sometimes they're pretty dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, is it possible for you to just put up, there was a slide that went by so fast. I think you had listed all of your areas of specialty. Is it possible to just reproject that for a quick second? Yeah, um, if you guys, I'll share the screen. Let me see a couple of 
Is this the uh, slide that you're looking for? It is, yeah. Okay, I'm just actually wondering, because I was just, this went by so quickly for me, but um, I noticed that there were a lot more areas of services here than in the visit lag uh, data that was submitted. And so I'm wondering, if, and some of it I realize is inpatient related, but to the degree that some of these uh, are outpatient services, we have cardiology, general surgery, infusion, ortho, neuro, and the Women's Center are the only services that um, there was data provided about the visit lag. So I'm wondering if you might be able to, uh, as a follow-up, submit that for some of these other services, you know, particularly areas where we know there are pain points and neurology being obviously one, you know, pain management has been one around the rest of the state. So yeah. trying to get a sense of access to some of these services uh, more broadly than what was submitted in the narrative. Yeah, that's helpful. I didn't know we were reporting pain management was not our service. That was an independent provider that we rented clinic space to, but we listed it up there because they come to sort of copy neurology. We can give you that. That used to be across the street. It was one of those uh, provider transfers a couple of years ago, but we'd be happy to provide those. Okay, um, so sure. some of these are not no longer copley provided services on this list. Well, neurology came over to us, so we absorbed that one. So we have that data. Pain management is kind of a little bit languishing because there's a void, and we have we've put our toe in the pool. We haven't fully committed to a pain management clinic, but we're trying to figure that out because it was a service for a long time. Uh, okay. Gastroenterology, we've folded that into general surgery. So there's a few nuances there, but I know a couple of hospitals uh, put up a slide like this. I think it's interesting. Maybe every hospital ought to have a, maybe you guys ought to have a spreadsheet to say every hospital, at least critical access hospital. So let us know what you guys are doing. Might be yeah, interesting. And, and HRAP is, um, you know, another process by which we're trying to gather that information and take an inventory of the types of services that each hospital offers. But it would yeah. even be helpful to understand wait times for urology and gastroenterology separately from just general surgery. Um, so if, if as a follow-up, that would be really helpful. And the other, I guess, request that I have is um, referral time. Refer referral lag wasn't submitted. And that's, you know, the difference between when a referral is submitted and when the appointment is scheduled. And I know you're redoing your EMR. So if it's an EMR issue, I would, my request would be as you're redoing your EMR to, to start capturing that data. And I say that as a patient who is now waiting over three weeks for an appointment to be scheduled. So I'm three weeks into my referral lag for a particular specialty service. So sometimes the referral lags can be just as long as the visit lags. So we're trying to begin to track that data and understand where the pain points are. So if it's not possible now, would you be willing to make it possible as you're restructuring your EMR? Or if it is possible, could you submit it? I mean, with all these, you know, would love to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page, uh, you know, like with definitions as well. So maybe, you know, what you're expecting, um, if you could, you know, get that to us as well. Sure. So, I think, yeah, we can, yeah, so, can talk. Yep. Yeah, Dr. Holmes, I, it's one of those things that, and this came up a lot in in your work group, I mean, you do Green Mountain Care Force work group about it. So it's a very hard thing to look at apples to apples because it definitely depends on what the acuity of the referral is. Is like we can almost see it the next day if you really need to be seen the next day. And it's so there's all this well, it's multifactorial. Yeah, as to how that works out. So good luck. No, and sense. I understand yeah. that there's some, you know, there are some uh triage that happens when there's scheduling, right? Absolutely, I understand that. And, and it, that's why it makes, it's helpful to make a comparison across specialties or within a specialty across um, hospitals, right? To some degree, yes, the acuity could be different at each hospital, but um, it just gives us a starting point to see where some of the pain points and access. Access is one of our you know, areas that we have to focus on. So we need to understand it better. So recognizing that no data point is perfect and that there are, um, you know, needs to be nuance in the interpretation. So if it's defined as non-urgent, when's the next available appointment? If there's not an urgency to it, might be a good way to start. Yeah, now, that's a great you're idea. Gonna be, I mean, you're going to be super discouraged when you see the data, though, because yeah. you're going to say, that's crazy. 
a lot of a lot of people do have to present with much more urgent need. You probably all know this. I think everybody knows this, but I know in society, if you can't see a doctor about an issue, some people just show up to the ER. So you probably know that that's uh, that's a that's some doctors will even say just go to the ER. They'll start no, the process. This was raised in a hearing just the other day, right? So absolutely, yep. there are primary care providers that know about the wait times for imaging and the prior authorizations associated with imaging, and they're sending patients to the ER to have that imaging done or to see a specialist because they know that the wait times are excruciatingly long. So we need to start understanding yeah. this and understanding if some of the ED utilization that's growing could be related to yes. you yeah. know, wait times elsewhere. So yep. we're trying to start tracking the data. So it would be really helpful However, you might be able to help us with some of that data. We'd appreciate it. Um, I, you know, my, something in the narrative was, found really interesting. So it was related to some of the transferring of patients um, out of the ED, the borders. And um, there was mention in there that Medicaid started reimbursing $200 a day for ED borders that have, you know, mental health uh, conditions and could not, cannot be placed in an inpatient psych. But Copley chose not to participate because of the administrative burden in getting that revenue. So I wanted to just understand that a little bit better. What was the administrative burden associated with getting those dollars in for patients that are boarding? It was basically, you know, when we took a look at the uh, the requirements, all the paperwork that would have to be filed and all the uh, criteria that have to be adhered to. It was that type of, uh, it was additional expenses on Copley that, uh, you know, we just basically um, at that time could uh, um, take on. We didn't have the staff to be able to do that appropriately. So if you, I mean, per patient, how long, what was, what would you estimate the time it would take per patient to fill in the paperwork? I'd have to get back to, you know, uh, the individuals that did that study. Okay, I'm just curious because you were the you only the you were the only hospital that mentioned the administrative burden, at least as far as yep. I can remember. Um, so understanding that, and and maybe there's a way that we can send a message over to Diva that says <laughs> like, hey, this is you know maybe there's a better way. Um, those were I think, um, yep, those were my questions. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon. This is Tom Walsh. Um, I don't have so much of um, so many questions, but I do have um, some comments. I really want to thank you for the the um, data that you brought in, the quality data uh, that you presented is um, the type that we'd like to incorporate more of in future years. Um, high quality, low prices are something that um, I think we want to be able to um, not just acknowledge, but celebrate and encourage. Um, your operating expense growth was less than or around, less than or equal to half of your revenue growth. That's outstanding. Your The ratio of admin to clinical uh, salaries was below the median, also outstanding. You know, the new numbers that we brought in uh, this year through the cost report, um, you you joked about it, but you look really good. And yes, there will be variability in how people fill the fill those forms out. But unless that variability is systematically biased among some of the hospitals, it'll average out. When we look at big groups and where you are will stay relatively the same compared to other groups. That's how averages work. And so you're you're doing some really good things. And at least from the number perspective. Um, and um, I just wanted to acknowledge that. I, I think that that's that's excellent. And the struggles with the with the uh, traveling staff, I think finding ways to um, you know, there's an there's an old saying that I've sometimes been annoyed by, <laughs> so I'm surprised that it pops to my head. But, um, you know, the, continuing to do the best you can to train and retain the staff that's available to you um, 
I hope you keep trying to figure that out because um, you, you're doing so many good things. And the, the turnover that comes from traveling people in and out is not only expensive, but it has cost as far as quality, safety, and reliability. Um, so uh, just some kudos. I know that may not come often from a regulatory body, um, but you presented a lot of compelling uh, information today. So thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. So I think I'm last up here for questions. Um, I've got a few for you all. Uh, I guess the first one, when you put up your slides initially with the change of your prices with the 15%, would you be able to put those back up again? And the before and after. They went by quick, so I, I, I just thought I saw something. I, I just wanted to make sure I, uh, I saw it right. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so that uh, one there is your. This one. Th that's the post. That yes. says this is the yeah, one the that if we applied our 15% and yep. gave every hospital. Yep. Uh, some some hospitals don't have their data even available. Yep. That's where the blanks are. Okay, so uh, your semi-private med surge room there is $1,300 a night. And then go back to your pre-15%. It's it's just thirteen hundred dollars a night that kind of stuck out to me that there was no 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 change. So, um, and, and I, I apologize I, that one was probably missed. Okay, I was just well, it, it made me th wonder when you're looking at applying the the commercial rate if you are going to apply it to both inpatient and outpatient. I I don't think I saw a breakdown of your in, intent uh, on how that commercial rate was going to be applied. So. Breaking down our rate increase between inpatient and outpatient, unless you're going and targeting the uh, the room and bed rates, is kind of a difficult uh, um, difficult task. When we look at our charges, we look at it more as hospital versus clinic, and due to the clinics actually, um, you know, adhering to uh, fixed fee schedules, we don't usually. Um, and I believe we did put this in our narrative. Uh, um, put the rate increase to the clinics. But we'll put them to the hospital charges. So a okay. good example is when you take a look at those uh, on diagnostic imaging, you don't know which of those are going to be inpatient and outpatient. So you just raise them um, as an individual. Okay. Um, so you would seek for additional revenue for an inpatient stay. That would just sort of be part of the yes the charge. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the other questions, if we this slide is, is fine to go on too. One of the big um, areas of revenue for your hospital is orthopedic procedures. And I was wondering if you had orthic, orthopedic procedure data compared to peers uh, in a similar fashion to this. So you're just looking at the cost for an orthopedic uh, type of uh, or, case? Yeah, or that, yeah, the, I guess. Um, is it your prices or is it your cost or is it your revenue? I would say it's the the price, the amount of money paid to the hospital, I guess, is my my interest in that. Well, every th this is where things get really complicated. I mean, the price is what we put out there on the bill, which goes to the commercial carriers, goes to Medicaid, Medicare. We don't charge you less. The bill is the bill and it's going to be applied to everybody. From there, you go to the commercial machinations to figure out what percentage of charges they're going to pay? You go, you know, the other machinations. So, well, how about in a in a similar way that this is presented? How's that to 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 not confuse things? Oh, you mean in terms of actual prices for the yeah. whole for, for yeah for orthopedics, we'd have to look at uh, the professional fees and then the technical fees. Some of the technical fees could be part of existing prices, so Jeff would have to sort of do that construct. It'd be nice if you we asked a few people to do that. You know, would find out the accounting errors, but it'd be nice to sort of say, "Hey, I wonder how much it costs a few of the hospitals. What is it to do a total shoulder or a total hip or a total knee?" I can appreciate it. It's a big, it's an expensive process and procedure, and you're actually dipping into something called Medicare price transparency, um, and it's something that I think Medicare is finding is not as easy as they thought it would be. 
um, because it comes down to it uh, um, how people classify code charge is so um, different. It makes it extremely complicated for patients that are trying to look at this data to get meaningful understandings. One simple thing is like what Joe was just saying, does that cost include the professional charge? Well, if that professional charge is, you know, a private practice doing the procedure, you're going to get another bill um, from another organization, not from Copley. Um, in addition, what makes this data very difficult to look at is our critical access status. And if you're a Medicare patient, it gets into different billing um, guidelines. We are a critical access um, hospital that bills method two. So it's really just an incredibly uh, challenging uh, um, number to get at. But, but the price is still the price. And if you look at CPT codes, I think you're making it like we should we should spend the time to understand this, both the CPT code, the professional fees, and maybe taking a dozen people that got total tips, you know, asking the audit, like, can we get, I don't know, I've, I've often thought about putting in the paper, would you mind sharing your bill? <laughs> like somebody ought to put in the paper, hey, you know, we'll give you $10 if you share your your total hip or spill to sort of look at it. And it's good, it's a great question, Dave. It's well, I think super we could, Maybe I'll take a peek at our, we have a price transparency calculator available to us and also yeah. the insurance companies do, so it might be just an interesting yeah. place to start. Um, one of the other things that I'm trying to sort of understand is on um, on the utilization slide that Sarah had put up is it's a kind of a complicated slide because it shows um, change in utilization. And so in one year it was 40 something percent and then followed by something in 30 percent, you know, uh, Again, this is sort of a complicated data source with your model of business, um, but I'm trying to understand when you when I see those high utilizations rates with some provider transfers in the budget, that your utilization projection for next year of 3.2%, it seems awfully low to me compared to your recent historical performance, your ED utilization you said is up with these new ortho, well, with a new ortho provider I know Eros is kind of, he came and he, he went and then came back, but uh, if you could sort of try to help me understand how 3.2% how came about when we have these, these higher numbers kind of kicking around. Yeah, so again, I think there's a lot of um, data going into, uh, you know, um, Sarah's numbers. And Sarah, if you could, those volume numbers are coming from Adaptive? Okay. And so again, when you see, um, you know, the uh, um, that spike um, from, I believe it's 20 to 21 go up. Um, I think a large part of that is due to our EMR conversion. But then when you see that number come down from 21 to 22, that specifically right there is a representation of um, us starting to ramp down on that provider that we were talking about. It was uh, due to our orthopedic provider um, basically, um, you know, running so, patients through the OR. Let me just sort of interrupt for a sec, because this, yeah. this where the where this gets to be a complicated figure is that's actually changed from the prior year. So that while in twenty one you were fifty percent above twenty, this is saying in twenty two you were thirty six percent above twenty one. So utilization still increasing. This is where I, I had the same look as you have on your face, and you have very small to me, but those are incredibly high utilization increases. So this is basically, you know, if you're up 50% one year and you're up 36% the year after, you're up over two years, some very large number. Yeah, we, we would have to unpack that. I see what you're saying now, yep. I don't understand what's it, what so is that? So this is both operating, operating expenses, money. net patient revenue, and utilization, right? Right. right. What's but what's behind those utilization numbers? Utilization of what exactly? Yeah, so as you might be aware, it's awfully difficult to count things outpatient. Um, and so what we do is we get an uh, adjusted discharge uh, value by taking the reported uh, inpatient discharges, uh, getting an average charge, using that charge, uh, and then applying that proportionally to your outpatient revenue and 
when appropriate, sniff in swing beds. So, so, so if our outpatient revenue goes up dramatically because we're doing joints as an outpatient, then when you normalize it, that's going to look huge when it might not have at all. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah, and if you figure out a better way to count outpatient services, please <laughs> let me know. Okay. So, yeah, that would be the Medicare then change going from inpatient to outpatient for our joints, which could be causing a great deal of that. The, I, yeah, and I appreciate the side of, Okay. I appreciate you bring this up, Dave. Like anytime we see aberrant data points, we'll study them, and then sometimes we're like, I don't, know, I don't have time to study it, but. That's a really good question, and it could be how we come up with adjusted discharges. So historically, hospitals had high inpatient, high inpatient revenue. Outpatients was a small percentage of it. When you sort of, how do we count these? You do this adjustment on the inpatient side, but Don's right. If you look at numerator denominator, I think we're probably wackadoodle, that's his term, uh, because of the outpatient. But we should look at that. I don't, I don't, we should really understand that because that's the only thing I could think of is that calculation methodology doesn't work when you're going that far that quickly to the outpatient basis. So the, the third side to this square, and maybe the fourth side is what I'm trying to figure out or just make it make it work, maybe it's a triangle, is the um, exhibit 10. Um, when I look at the change in net NPR FPP 2324, it's broken down by rate and utilization, and the vast majority of your increased revenue on this appears to be rate versus utilization. But I think we've been talking about a lot of utilization changes, and so I'm just trying to understand um, why the utilization projections seem so modest compared to, you know, the the, the rate projections. Because I, I, you know, the, you're doing a lot of outpatient procedures that should generate, I would think, would generate. Uh, a, a good amount of revenue. Like if you look at the outpatient part, you've got 6.5 million due to from 22 to 24 due to rate of commercial revenue and 720,000 due to utilization. Uh, it just doesn't, I guess that just it doesn't make sense to me you know, from what you're saying about your increased utilization. I, Dave, I agree. I know Sarah's chart that she just showed us was not just utilization. There were three descriptors, right? In the top, Sarah, it had to do with net patient revenue expenses and utilization. So if you look at her chart, read the top of it, it has three factors. We call it utilization and we're boring into that, but there's three, appears to be three factors in that calculation. So I don't know, Sarah, help me out. Lifeline, anybody? Um, yes, yeah, so. I'm sorry, maybe I misheard, but I thought Dave was talking about exhibit 10. Yeah. 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 Which one is exhibit? We don't have exhibit 10, that's what we submitted. Oh. Yep, yep. You know, uh, I can pull it up. <laughs> I don't, do we have exhibit yeah. 10? Is that ours? It's through it down. Oh. Is this the right year? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it takes Dr. Berman's points well taken, though. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Thank you. I'll understand that's way because we're going to have increased utilization with the team. Yeah, so this is trying to kind of dissect how much of your change in NPR and GPR is due to rate versus utilization versus payer mix. And so what we see here is, uh, according to this exhibit, most of it being driven by rate. Yeah. And that coincides to what uh, we communicated, you know, our utilization is only going up 3%. And so this schedule reflects that. Yeah. But again, it comes back to, you know, that utilization indicator. What will totally take that and put it on its ear is if your uh, patients don't really change, i.e. you're not getting, you know, um, you're getting the same patients, but they're shifting from an inpatient environment to an outpatient environment. That is going to greatly change your adjusted discharge number um, just because of that, uh, um, that uh, the way it's being calculated. Okay. Maybe would you take a look at this with Sarah and make sure because I know that there were some um, issues with the Exhibit 9 uh, with the commercial insurance Medicare Advantage uh, component that you fixed and. Uh, yeah, we'll get that. The, this is the, yeah, this is the older one. Yeah. yeah. Um, would you just take a look at it with Sarah and, and, and see if it 
it seems accurate. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, I guess I just have just one more question, which is um, which is really something you mentioned in the in in the hearing today and in the the narrative about the decision to stay with your current EHR instead of switching to Cerner, and I believe this was 2019. And I, I was just wondering if you could um, sort of comment a little bit on what drove that decision and what the what the financial impact of that decision is either in, in cost avoidance or in predicted, uh, you know, a lot of people switch EHRs to try to increase their their billing and coding and and uh, financial performance. If if you could sort of comment on the financial calculation of not switching. Um, thanks, Dave. I'll take that. So, worked in six hospitals. I used to be president of the New England Healthcare Information Management System Society for the six states. My background is industrial engineering. I studied Fortran seventy seven. I know human factors engineering. I was an industrial engineer in manufacturing. Um, people don't fully appreciate that much like in any relationship that starts to go south, you're half the problem, perhaps in the relationship. Maybe you're more than half the problem. Maybe you're 70% of the problem. But when you look at an IT system, oftentimes we just are very um, dismissive and say that it doesn't work. What's wrong with this printer? Oftentimes we'll call IT people who say, well, you need to turn the button on because it's not on. Or did you read, you know what I mean? So there's a lifetime of a culture in America where we are very unwilling to read the manuals, figure things out and get the most out of the system. And we just change systems. So I've been in hospitals that do that. I've seen a lot of hospitals in Vermont do it through the Green Mountain Care Board Public Oversight Committee process. They have spent millions and millions of dollars. I've never seen a hospital change an IT system and be on budget. They're never under budget. They're always over budget dramatically. Remember years ago, Porter, um, I think had a three to $4 million estimate. Theirs came in at $7 million. And Porter since has moved to Epic. I have a lot of friends and acquaintances and people that have changed information systems, and they're not learning that they are part of the problem with the current system because they're not understanding it, changing their behavior, understanding the features and getting the most out of the system. It's very rare for somebody to say, we're gonna get the most out of the system before we just jump. When they do jump, Dave, more often than not, a year or two goes by, they're very frustrated, very angry, it's expensive and they blame the system and they sound like they were the complaining partner pre-conversion. So I'm not a big fan of jumping out of an IT system unless we really understand the value because um, learning the features, reading the manuals, working on understanding if you're going to make any changes or how to do interfaces or how to manage updates. I'm looking at my IT fellow here who's shaking his head. So, so Dave, we decided not to do that because the expense of going to a Cerner would have been staggering. And we did not have the discipline of using an IT system sufficiently. So we're working on flexing those muscles. I will tell you maybe Maybe two to five years from now, we might start and say, OK, we're going to look for a new IT system. Maybe two to five years from now, we're going to have that drive interest in learning and we'll say, OK, it's time for a new system and I think we're going to participate. But uh, you know these hospitals, well, you just, you'll, you'll find it out or you've seen it through hospitals that change information systems. It's wildly expensive. When I worked as part of the Mass General System, as part of Partners on Martha's Vineyard Hospital, uh, which is listed as the largest day's cash on hand, Sarah, in your charts, which is really awesome. Um, but Martha's Vineyard Hospital was getting epic, and the price tag that we had to pay at one point, the estimate was this was $500 million to convert the hospitals over. That went to 750. I was there for a short period of time. It eclipsed $1 um, billion dollars and it got up to 1.5 billion dollars for the conversion price estimate that started at 500 million 
this happens everywhere. So I wish, I, I don't think we could afford it, Dave. We couldn't afford it money-wise. We couldn't afford it emotionally. We couldn't afford it intellectually. But I'm hopeful three to five years from now, we might be at a place where we're strong, understand what we're doing and saying, listen, we really should buy something. I don't know what the buy is though. I wish Epic would give an Epic light software install to small hospitals. There's only 1400 critical access hospitals in the country. I would think Epic or some others might come up with a more abbreviated version because we don't need the complexity of Epic. So I, when I got here, I said, we're not doing it. We can't afford it. We, we definitely couldn't afford it. Sorry for that long winded answer. Dr. I, I thought it might be. <laughs> do you have a do you have a numerical analysis of it? Oh, for us personally? Yeah. No. no. Okay. I could send you some articles from hymns. Yep. That's thank you. That is that is all I have. Thank you so much. Any other board member questions? I'll just say I think I think I will skip the executive session given the time since uh, we're towards the end of our time, unless anyone else is dying to to and has some questions. Otherwise, I can I can forgo mine. I think I think I'm okay. Um, you might be able to get the information another way potentially if we need it. Um, but okay, um, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate for any questions or comments. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, this is Sam Peich with the Healthcare Advocates Office. Um, I don't think this is an executive session question. I hope it's not because I do want to keep to time. Um, but I'm just wondering if Copley has made a decision about participating with OneCare yet. I know in your narrative you'd said in the summer you'd make a decision, so I wasn't sure if you had, so I wanted to ask. So at this time, um, we, you know, for our budgets, um, the budgets have been built with the assumption that one care, um, you know, we would be, um, you know, uh, in one care. But at this time, we have um, gotten a uh, um, a delay from one care to make that decision. So we're, we're going to make it at the end of September. We're really looking at the pros and cons, the price, the issues of revenue, fees, value. I mean, one care. I mean, I think a lot of the world has been turned upside down with one care and um, we're, 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 adding, we're having those serious conversations about whether or not to continue, but I don't have an answer yet. Okay, thank you. That's all the only question I had. Great, um, any public comment? All right. Uh, seeing none, um, Mr. Wooden, I'll turn it back to you and your team if you have any uh, closing remarks you want to leave us with. No, I, I appreciate listening to our challenges. I'm glad that we're cost effective. I really stress about trying to understand if we can afford that and how we move forward just because we've got some dire capital needs. We did replace our MRI. We had probably the oldest mobile MRI in New England. Uh, it was so old. Uh, we've, we're, we're trying to invest in the back infrastructure. I think the clinical care we deliver is amazing. I think the staff and the competency around true clinical care and even our experiential care with patients is amazing. There is a lot of other stuff related to equipment, buildings, um, where we work, IT infrastructure, there's a whole bunch of stuff that it just really is screaming for some attention. So we're gonna try to address that. I, I wanted to ask Nancy as our board chair or Kathy also, if they wanted to add any other comments, uh, just to really appreciate them being here. And so if you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, I just would like to say, Copley is really important to this community and not only to the whole community, but as the healthcare community, we depend on Copley for a lot. And I know running home health, I can call over here anytime and get the help I need for anything. Um, I can call Dr. Dupuy because one of my nurses has a question and he gets right on the phone. Um, we share expertise back and forth. Um, 
I have a nurse that comes to discharge planning, so we make sure there's a smooth transition of care back and forth. Um, we get to use their tent outside for <laughs> our own staff things. I mean, so they share everything with us that we could possibly need. Um, and it's just so vitally important to this community that whatever we have to do to keep it whole and keep it functioning the way it is, is what we need to do. So thank you for listening to all this and how important everything is here for all of us. Yeah, and I guess that I would just say that the community connections, first of all, you know, I would share that Copley enjoys this very special place in this community, um, which I think even the medical staff would agree is very unusual that a hospital is so beloved in the community. Um, but uh, the board understands that we're not a standalone organization and at our retreat, um, in October, we're really going to be um, thinking about how we can really um, do even more engagement with all the other um, health related organizations within the community. I think we have a lot of pride about how we do interact, but I think that we realize that this is something that we need to continue to work on and it's a continuing challenge. And so it's gonna be one of the focus areas of our retreat um, to look at community connections and how we continue to deepen them to avoid duplication of services and ensure that we are actually providing the services that are needed by the community. Thanks. I know Dr. Dupuy wanted to make a comment. Yeah, one of the things that I think is pretty easy to, to overlook, uh, and I know I often do, when, when Joe talks about capital needs and crummy looking pipes, I know some of you all have, have been here and seen some of them, um is i go yeah that's that's i'm sure that's very important joe but really what does that have to do with with patient care uh, and, and i know i felt exactly that way when some months ago uh joe uh when uh delivered a project that gave us an alternative way of getting potable water into the hospital and i thought okay that's nice but what does that have to do with patient care except when we had the floods and the Morrisville Municipal pumps got flooded and therefore our water was sort of thought to be until we know otherwise contaminated and we couldn't use it. The only way we were gonna stay functional as a hospital was getting gigantic tanker trucks with fresh potable water hooked up to this brand spanky new system of getting potable water into the hospital with the with the booster pumps that allowed the hospital to still be a hospital during that time. So you know, even things that are just hard to see the utility end up becoming completely useful because we would not have been a hospital at all for a week if we didn't have that. And it's and we couldn't have sat here and told you last year how important spending money on that one thing would have been. Anyway, so thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your time. Um, I think that's all we had in the agenda. So is there any uh, new business or old business to come before the board? And is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And um, we are adjourned.